want to welcome everybody back uh, before I present our faculty for this session entitled The, Eras of AD the Era of ADCs in the Treatment of Non-Small Cell, Class Overview and Specifics of Trope 2, HER3, CMET, and CCAM, um, also known as the ABCs of ADCs. I'd like to turn your attention again to the screen where you'll find a QR code. Please take a moment and scan the code or go to the URL listed on the screen to participate in the pre-session survey about the content you're uh, going to hear uh, during this session. The questions, again, are completely anonymous, and your answers will help our team tailor future education programming. Uh, we greatly appreciate your participation. So pause for a few seconds so you can do that. Uh, again, I want to acknowledge uh, that this session is supported by an independent educational grant, in this case from Sanofi, although uh, as you're about to see, Dr. Malosky, our uh, Canadian import, uh, is going to be quite fair and uh, comprehensive. And she will uh, enlighten us in the next 35 minutes or so on the ABCs of ADCs. I have to have a, I have a disclosure. I'm extremely jet lagged still from Singapore. <laughs> and it, I was just getting over it. And then I had to wake up today, 6.30, which is 3.30 in the morning, Vancouver time. So like, I'm back like where I was. <laughs> All right, um, here are my disclosures. Well, today I'm going to talk about really just four of these. Uh, that was my sort of session they gave me, Trope 2, HER3, CMET, and CCAM5. And then I think our next speaker will be talking about HER2. I'm going to talk about the mechanism of action. I'm going to talk about the biomarker and, and what we should do with some of these drugs that don't have biomarkers. And finally, I'm going to talk about the clinical trials because they're exploding. In fact, this year at World Lung, there maybe was 10 different sessions on ADCs, two lunch symposiums. And one of the sessions, they called it the tsunami of ADCs. So this is just going crazy in lung. So I'm going to compare um, the defects in a lot of these drugs to diamonds. And my husband gave me my diamond 30 years ago, and he had no money. So I've actually never checked the clarity of it. <laughs> I, have a, I have a horrible feeling it's going to be a cubic zirconium. But the clarity really is what caught, caught the diamond is what makes them so expensive. And you can't tell it when you look at someone's ring. Is something a jeweler has to look at with, a, with their special sort of microscope. Okay, the mechanism of action is, this is a simple cartoon, it's not that simple. These are antibodies that can be designed to whatever surface antigen you want them designed to. They're gonna be, have a linker, and that linker's gonna be attached to a chemotherapy payload. And the antigen, the antibody goes towards the antigen, however you've devised it, gets engulfed. If it has a non-cleavable linker, and there's only one of those, it has to go to a lysosome. The rest can just release the payload into the cell. And that cell then kills the cancer and it degrades. And there's a bystander effect. Some of that payload will actually leak out and hit cells nearby and hit cells that don't even have that antigen. So the bystander effect can actually be very large. You hear people say it's all about the payload. The payload is called the warhead, and it's usually DNA damaging or tubulin inhibitors. There's more coming out. But really, is it all about the payload? In my opinion, no, it's about the linker. The linker decides the chem chemical stability of the ADCs, and it also determines how much drug you can attach to them. Well, today I'm going to talk about ADCs against trope. Uh, panitumumab, deruxetecan, TZOV, and Tavarab, that's what I'm going to call them. Trope. There's now three ADCs. There used to, a couple months ago, there was only two. Um, but you can sort of see, I'm going to try to talk about all three. And it's confusing. Why do we need three ADCs? DATO-DXD is a daishi psychodrug with collaboration with AstraZeneca. Satuzumab so govotetin is a Gilead drug. Gilead and Merck have two clinical trials collaborations. Merck, or MK2870, is a partnership between Keelan and Merck. In other words, they're all sleeping together, <laughs> or we thought you were. Well, the beauty about 
uh, trope in lung cancer is you can sort of see the normal tissue trope is not expressed. But in cancers, including breast and lung, uh, it's heavily expressed. And you can actually measure uh, the intensity of it, but the problem is, you can see from the bottom pie, is almost 100% of adenocarcinomas have trope. They're not all plus two, and I think AstraZeneca and probably Gilead is working on trying to find the biomarker. But as of today, most trials are not selected for trope expression. Dato DXD, again, this is the uh, AstraZeneca trope for all the tropian trials, and you can sort of see the antibody. Deroxatecan stands for the Daishi linker and payload together. And you can see the DAR, where I put the star at the bottom, is quite high at eight. And tropian pantumor was, was actually presented by Dr. Guerin in, in our chair. There was 180 patients that had non-small cell. And in those patients, the response rate, when they were given the trope, the ADC, was only 28%. But look at the spider plots. Look, those are beautiful. So a lot of people are having deep responses. Um, by resist criteria, it doesn't look that good, but, but the spider plots, it looks, it looks excellent. And you can sort of see that it didn't matter what the trope score was by any way you looked at it. Well, 34 of that 180 actually had an actional genomic alteration, a new word for all of us. And the majority of those were EGFR, and the majority of those were pri had prior osimertinib. And now the response isn't 28 percent, it's 35. And this is going to actually be verified in a phase two trial at ESMO called Tropian Lux Lung 5 with 137 patients. So we'll see if it acts out. Well, the defect in this diamond is for this drug is this and that's stomatitis. And you might say, well, you know, we're gonna learn how to fix that. I, 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 I was a big fat in a person for four years. Well, Tropian Lung 1 is their phase three trial against docetaxel. Tropian Lung 2 is a complicated trial. Presented, the initial results were presented by Dr. Levy in Vienna. It's looking at Dato DXD and Pembro, a doublet, and then with a platinum, a triplet. Well, it looks better in first line than it does in second. I wonder if you need the carbo. They, they look about the same. And again, looking at the spider plots, it looks irregardless of PDL1. Tropian lung four was presented at the World Lung 10 days ago, which is why I'm feeling like I got hit by the head. <laughs> so tropian lung four, like we saw before, looking at a doublet or a triplet. But now the drug isn't Pembro, it's Devalumab. And small numbers, but the triplet actually looks a bit better. And AstraZeneca's plans for the future tropian trials is to give platinum with it. Response rate was, again, across all PDL1 levels, although to my eye, it looks a bit better the higher the PDL1. Well, this is their competition. This is the Gilead drug. I'm going to call it SG. And again, antibody linker payload. Their original 54 patients in 2017 showed a response rate of 19%, so a bit low, but again, a, a reasonable 5.2 month PFS and OS in a heavily pretreated population. And what's interesting is you don't see mucositis in this, in this chart. And this drug has been around for some time in breast cancer. And so when I look at the breast cancer protocol and I look at the label, the rate of mucositis is only 10%. It has other problems, and it's much earlier than the tropian trials, but the mucositis isn't there. It was presented at World Lung as well. This is the Evoke 2 trial. This is SG and Pembro in the first line metastatic setting. It's going to look at two different doses of Pembro, greater than 50 or less than 50, but really this is SG and chemo, and Pembro, excuse me. Response rates look again very good. The patients with low pd one look a bit higher than the other patients. But I think the telling thing again is to look at a spider plot. And I always teach that to the residents. This is where you're really seeing not only activity, response rate, but durability. Evoke 3 is coming. This is their phase three randomized trial. And this is the other, the third drug, MK2870. It doesn't even have a name yet. 
is a heavily populated, heavily pretreated population with a response rate of about 43% and an OS of almost 15 months. And I think the interesting thing about this early trial with a drug that doesn't have a name yet is the toxicity looks excellent. Yes, you can get neutropenia, but there's no case of ILD or ocular dysfunction. Okay, I'm gonna to move to HER3. Pachachumamab deroxatecan, HER3 DXD. The, the door here is high, and again, this is the Daishi linker payload. And you might be thinking, what does HER3 have to do with lung cancer? Well, I was taught it had no intrinsic kinase activity, and we forget about it. But the truth is that HER3 actually combines, dimerizes with HER2, and that leads off the PIK3 pathway. Well, the EGFR well type data was presented in ASCO 2002, uh, did not include EGFR, again, EGFR well type. There was a whole bunch of other different mutations, including HER2, KRAS, BRAF, and you can see the response rate was irregardless of the mutation a patient had or if a patient didn't have, and the response rate's about 25, or 26 to 30 percent. But when you look in the EGFR data, this is EGFR mutated, previously treated, the response rate is higher. It's 39 percent in 57 patients with a median survival that hadn't been reached. And again, per Pre-treatment HER3 did not predict response, but by either way you looked at it. Herthina Lung 1 was actually presented by, by Dr. Yu, who we met this morning. At World Lung, she presented a very large phase two trial, 225 patients. You'd almost call that <laughs> phase three, but they're all given this drug uh, at a fixed dose now at 5.6% 5.6 per kilo. The response rates come down a bit, from 39 to 32.4, but it's irregardless if your resistance to EGFR was because of an EGFR pathway, a different pathway, or unknown. And it has brain activity. Herthina Lung 2 is their phase 3 trial that is just starting, and this is again in patients who had had one or two previous TKIs, including osimertinib, Patients are randomized to HER3 DXD versus the platinum doublet, not selected for HER3. And that's probably the defect in this diamond, that there is no way to select these patients. And in countries like mine, Canada, uh, last year I used the word social health care and all the U.S. doctors' shoulders went up, so I'm going to use universal health care. Uh, biomarkers are actually needed for drug approval. And, you know, if there's no biomarker, can we really call this targeted therapy? Okay, MET. There's only one drug in this field so far, and that's Toluso V. And the DAR's a bit low, but they have no competition. And you can stain for MET as well as they did. Uh, the staging is a bit difficult. Zero, one, two, and three, and they're gonna define intermediate as, th as strong plus three, in 29 to 49 of the cells. And they're gonna define high MET as IUC plus three in 50% of the cells. And it's a difficult biomarker because it can be very heterogeneous in the same tumor. The luminosity trial was presented by Dr. Camridge and you know the statistics did not do well for the EGFR patients nor in the squamous, but there is a strong signal in this non-squamous cohort. This drug has its own toxicity, including peripheral sensory neuropathy and blurred vision. Dr. Goldman, at the same meeting, presented a phase one trial of only 18 patients that were on osimertinib and progressing, and he added the Talisa V to it. So he, collect, co he kept the osimertinib going. And now look at that response rate. Only 18 patients, 58%. This was updated at a Japanese meeting. They added six more patients, and now the response rate is about 50%. And here's their phase three trial called Telemet. Patients are randomized with high or intermediate MET expression to Telizo V or docetaxel. And the defen defect in this diamond, unlike HER3, where it was because they didn't have a biomarker, this one is difficult. It's gonna drive our pathologists crazy. 
Okay, finally, CCAM5. Tetuzumab ravastatine. I'm going to call it Tuzarav. It took me forever, by the way, to Sanofi to find a picture where the antibody was on the left side of the, the slide. Now, what's the beauty of this targeting in lung is that it's not found in normal lung. It's found in lung cancer, not as high as colorectal, but colorectal is found in normal colorectal as well. So the beauty of this is if you give a patient that's positive for CCAM5 with lung cancer, it's going to go to the cancer cells, not the normal lung. And you can sort of see how they're going to define their, hot, their biomarker kind of different than the CMET, a little bit more, not as difficult, but still different, high, moderate, and negative. And the moderate is about a third of the patients with lung cancer, and the high is in about a quarter. And it's in all stages, and these drugs are soon going to be moved to earlier lines, there's no doubt. Well, here's their phase 1-2 study of Tuzarav, 80 patients with lung cancer, and the response rate is higher in the high expressors. In fact, it's not that high in the moderate, 7.1%. And they presented their data of patients who were on this trial for over a year. And I, I'm, this is the beauty of ADCs, is you're on them for a very long time if you're lucky to respond. There's two patients there that have been on it over four years. And this was a year ago. And for seven of the patients, the, the duration of response was over two years. Now, this is a trial that Dr. Louis Perez uh, presented at uh, ECC this year, and this is a complicated trial. Again, they're looking at two different doses of Tuzarav. They're looking at it as a doublet, as a triplet, or even a quadruplet. And you might say, well, what are, what, 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 why do they even have to add these other drugs? Well, if you think about it, that payload is usually a tumor in isomerase. It doesn't have a platinum in it. And our current treatment is IO and chemo to include a platinum, either 9LA or 189 or 407. And you can sort of see that the doublet is just Pembro alone. The triplet is with pem platinum. And the quadruplet is with PEM platinum. And again, complicated trial. But you can sort of see the response rate here is really quite acceptable. 52%. It didn't matter on your PDO1. It didn't matter on your level of expression. And it didn't matter what dose. So they're going to go with the lower dose of 150. And they have a large developmental plan. I'm going to show you a couple of them. The first is Carmen Lung 5 or Lung 3. Again, their second line trial with docetaxel. And I was offered to do this trial in Canada. Many of my colleagues are, uh, but turned it down because I wanted to do, I, I, I already agreed to a trope trial. They're going only in those patients that high expression, and you know, hats off to them, because uh, I think that's how the CMET trial should have been. Now, this is an interesting finding. CEA is not CCAM5. We sort of learned that in the noon hour session. But they're both kind of CEA molecules, and I've been, I came from a GI world. I still measure CEAs in the majority of my lung cancer patients. And in those patients who had a CEA plasma level of less than 100, the response rate to CCAM5 was only 8.1%. But the response rate, if you're CEA at baseline, a blood test, it was 41.7. Now these are in high expressors, but the trial they're doing is going to be in patients with negative expression. So they want to see if this concept holds irregardless of the expression. And the defect in this diamond is one, the biomarker, again, but the corneal problems. And I used to think it was much worse, but when I'm doing more reading and I'm talking to more of my colleagues, most of these are grade one or two. Most patients are asymptomatic. And those patients that have been on it over years and four years, none of them have stopped due to, due to this problem. So it's mild. All right, a couple sort of general sort of questions. Why is pneumonitis seen with all of these? In my opinion, I have to say opinion because I always get people coming up to me and arguing, is it's, it's the payload. And why do I say that? 
because I showed you that trial that Dr. Guerin presented with the tropian pan tumor study, and when they dropped the dose from eight to six, the pneumonitis was halved. Why are, why are corneal vents seen with old ADCs? And my opinion is something really interesting a colleague told me, that the concentration of lysosomes in the cornea is the highest concentration in the entire body. So maybe the payload's being released because of this. Why are all these trials combining with checkpoint inhibitors? Well, one, it's a perfect world. This, these ADCs have an FG domain, which is connected to antibody cellular cytotoxicity. And activation of CD8 cells happens when you add a pd one inhibitor to them. But for me, the real sort of uh, flawless in the flaw in the diamond, or flawless in the diamond, is in this setting. This is an unmet need in our patients who are EGFR positive, progressing an OSI. And I have those one or two a week. I have a huge EGFR practice, kind of like Karen's. I showed you the original trial that 180 patients, 34 of them had actual genomic alterations. Their response rate was higher than the entire group. I showed you the HER3 data with EGFR positive progressing on OSI. The response rate was higher in wild type. I showed you the Dr. Goldman's study with the Talizo V progressing on OSI and adding OSI. Was response rates early on was 58%, now 50. And this is a race. This is a race to find the, the first drug. Is it going to be Ami, Lazartinib, Ami, and Chemo, and Lazartinib, Ossi, and Safalitinib, or the Insight 2, Petchumamed, Dexorectican, Dato DXD, or Talisa V with Ossi. And um, I, competition is good, it'll make this race go faster. So again, these are unique. Um, it's exploding onto our scene. We have to learn them. We're going to have to learn how to help the toxicities, and we will. I showed you the phase three trials. Um, the molecular testing is going to be difficult in some of these drugs, and some of these drugs may not fly in countries like mine because there is no biomarker. They're changing the treatment of the lung cancer landscape. That's probably a cubic zirconium. <laughs> Flawless, just like your presentation. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Miloski. Uh, great uh, talk. Great overview of what I've sometimes seen hours and hours and hours and hours of presentation and a field that, frankly, is still very new. Um, we do have some time for questions, but before we jump in again, please take a moment and participate in the post-session uh, survey. Scan the uh, QR code or go to the URL listed on the screen. The survey, again, is completely anonymous, um, and we greatly appreciate your participation. So um, let me see if we're getting any questions here. Just a sec. Um, Dr. Guerin. Yeah, well, you're looking for questions. I, <laughs> I find this to be a really difficult area to explain to people, because you, you've done an excellent job of presenting it, but in, it doesn't make any sense to me uh, in some respects. So you listed a bunch of, of antibody drug conjugates where it appears it doesn't make any difference what the antibody is or what the expression level is, and they seem to work the same. And so there are three deruxtecan-based compounds, the data with, if your target is HER3 versus trope 2, the data looks essentially identical. Then you presented data on other compounds, looking at MET and CCAM, and there it looked like they're finely tuned to the amount of expression of the target on the cells. So is it just that the data is the data and, and we get what we get, or is there some logic that's hard for me to see in all of this? <laughs> well, I, I, in, in talking to AstraZeneca, they they are discussing biomarker for trope because they're not, even though they're all trope positive, they're not all plus two. So I think they're just going to need that. The uh, Pachumamab directs the TK, and I have a harder time to explain, mostly because 
Oops, the target, HER3, is a difficult target. It's connected to HER2. There's this upregulation with osimertinib or EGFR treatment. Uh, so that's a little bit more harder for me to understand. But they'll have their challenges as well. And the challenge won't be that you can give it to everyone, but the regulators might make them to find a biomarker. And, and any sense why, as a target, MET and CCAM would be dependent on expression and TROPE 2 would not? <laughs> I have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and 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 just have sort of concluded yeah, it I don't is know what either. it is. But yeah. but yeah, I I have, I I have certainly not been able to find the. But you know, you look at like theory. the next talkers on her too. Yeah. They were better in her two mutation, not the IHC. Like, but they still have some activity yeah. in IHC. Yeah. So I guess my question, I think this is the question that we're all puzzling with, is this chemo on steroids, or is this targeted therapy? Is it both, or is it neither? <laughs> or is it, does it depend on the target or the payload? Yeah. Well, the, the payload is chemo, but it's not chemo that we've typically used in the clinic. In fact, these are drugs that are by themselves often quite toxic that we would never use uh, if we just gave it systemically. Yeah, someone asked that question, actually, at a meeting that I was at, like, why, you know, tubulin inhibitors and, you know, MMAE, and those are the only drugs that are stable enough to attach to the linkers. As opposed to the drugs that we normally use, okay. But that's why they're adding Pembro and, and, and Platinum and, and Perbo, you know. Minus the Pemetrexate. So basically some of the, uh, the data, the uh, Tropion uh, yeah, trials are basically variations on Keno 189 minus yeah, uh, Pem. Yeah. Sort of a one, one substitution. A um, couple of questions have come in. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure you can answer either of these, but give it, give it the college try. Um, what's the cause of ILD? Uh, do we know? Um, is it your lysosome uh, theory? Yeah. Is there some other um, uh, reason for it? Well, my theory is, is that it's due to the payload being, it's released. It, it might be even the bystander, because we're dealing with lung cancer, and it's going to the lung. And it's actually seen in all of them. I mean, I showed the Merck drug, but it's really early days. So the, the, the later days may catch up with, uh, and yeah. show us some pneumonitis. It's much less do you, with do you think it's uh, You think it's very payload dependent then? Yes. So deruxtecan yeah. particularly seems to be associated with that. Well, um, no, because it's not seen in the HER3 DXD, mm -hmm. which is the same payload and linker. So that sort of nullifies that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a well, problem. And I, I guess, how do you contend with it? If somebody gets it, besides throwing steroids at these, would you ever rechallenge them, number one? Number two, I think you mentioned in one of your earlier talks you had a fatality. Yeah. Uh, and uh, is there any work being done now to try to uh, prevent it or mitigate it uh, um, uh, yeah, it's a very, I, th I think this is going to be a learning curve. I think it's due diligence to see these patients and being doing chest x-rays and CTs and listening to their symptoms and taking everything about this very seriously. Mm. But we're doing CTs all the time on these people, I mean, periodically. Yeah, but, you know, I think we heard someone give a talk on Aussie in the adjunct setting, and they're doing CTs every six months, right? And Definitely. not that that. This is similar, but uh, you know, I think we, we really have to take caution with this class of drugs and ILD. The other question that's come in, I think the answer is, well, at least for now is obvious, maybe down the pike isn't obvious. Which ADC is showing the most promise in HER2 lung cancer? TD, T TDXC, we'll right. hear about. Do you think anything will displace that? I mean, that's the most impressive. Yeah, and it's I certainly do. better than TDM1. I don't think, I'm not going to word displace. I'm going to word compete with that. Uh -huh. And it's a trial that we're doing with um, the Boeing or Ingeheim HER2 TKI. HER2 TKI. So not a uh, uh, ADC. I guess the question is, uh, would there be a, do you but think there, there is might be other? They have no competition now, but they mm -hmm. will. I guess the, the other questions I have, um, you know, they're all being compared to docetaxel second line. We, I think we've had at least one press release so far that's positive, but given the toxicity profiles, um, what's your personal metric for actually using it in that setting? Uh, 
Now, docetaxel is toxic in its own right, so if it's equitoxic and it's got better PFS, that's an easy one. But okay, so docetaxel has. A, this is Francis Shepard's trial, uh -huh. my mentor. Response rate is ten percent. PFS was three months, and all women lose their hair. So you think it's an easy bar to pass, but it's taken us many, many years to uh, pass that bar. I don't like the drug. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes it. <laughs> Other questions, Eddie? Yeah, I, I have one more, and this is, it, so you showed a whole bunch of studies that are looking at adding this drug to a PD-1 inhibitor in the frontline setting. Um, but if I want to add chemo to a PD-1 inhibitor in the first line setting, I can do it. Um, uh, I have the, you know, particularly for non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, I have carboplatin pemetrexid, as I mentioned earlier, on the west side of Los Angeles. They like that they don't lose their hair. Um, <laughs> they, and that may not be restricted to the west side of Los Angeles. Um, they, you know, in, in squamous disease, uh, obviously there, there are other regimens, and, and as we've talked about earlier, there are other regimens that include CTLA-4 inhibition as well. Who's the population you think they're fighting for here that I wouldn't want to give sort of a chemo immuno combination, but I want to give this targety sort of chemo immuno combination? They, they think their drug is better than 189. The response rates in the uh, trial by Dr. Levy show are over 60%. So they think they're better. Okay. But at the cost of omitting at least one component of 189 by uh, getting rid of the uh, pemetrexid. So right there, that's a statement that we think adding it to conventional chemo is more toxic. And I think that's certainly that's my general impression. I don't know if that's everybody else's. But uh, and the uh, I guess the additional factor is that you are introducing chemotype toxicities that you don't generally see with uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So. Uh, it's chemo on top of chemo in that regard. But if it's better, it's better. It doesn't matter. Um, other, any other questions? Everybody's so quiet. Attentive, but quiet. <laughs> Wonderful review. Okay, thank, thank you so much. You.